Hi, I'm Barry Ostrowski. At Barnabas Health, we believe citizens need to be informed about the important health care issues affecting their lives. That's why we're proud to support health care programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners on public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Barnabas Health, Qualcare Inc., the law firm of Gibbons PC, Verizon Communications, and by TD Bank. This is One on One. That's good acting, man. I get that a lot. I go to Atlantic City all the time. Like, are you the guy? I go, no, I'm not. This is one you can't afford to miss. They thought that would survive it, but I knew I would. Where do I look? Stress. She's asking where she looks, but she's the one who's going to tell us about stress. She is uh, Thea Singer, author of a wonderful book called Stress Less for Women, Calm Your Body, Slow Aging and rejuvenate the mind in five simple steps. Why are you asking where you have to look? Relax. Okay, no stress. No. Okay. Hey, why, let me ask you something. Even though the book is for women, you said it's also for men. Yes. You argue that we are too stressed. You argue that uh, diet, sleep, sleep, uh, excuse me, uh, sleep deprivation and exercise and a whole range of issues having a big impact on our stress level. Absolutely. But you say there are five simple steps to deal with it. Okay, let me explain about the five, the five simple steps well, and the, the men tell you versus you women. To say that? The publisher did say <laughs> we needed. The publisher said that actually. Um, there are chapters in there are five chapters. I call them the intervention chapters, where I talk about ways to reduce stress and slow aging. Because what the book really concentrates on is the link between stress and aging, all the way down to our cells, and that's where the new science comes in. So there are five chapters in there that okay. provide tips on ways that you can reduce your stress and slow your aging. Do you believe, and by the way, what are you doing walking around with a shoelace? She's got a shoelace. Got this from the hotel guy. <laughs> no, come on, Steve, get a shot of this. This is my prop. This what are you is doing my, with it? This is my prop for, uh, to explain the science behind cellular aging, all which right. is caused by stress. Okay, we have chromosomes that lie in the nucleus of our cells, right? And on our chromosomes, there lies our DNA. That's the substance of our being. At the ends of the chromosomes are these little tips, just like there are these little plastic tips on the ends of these shoelaces. Yes. These are called telomeres, the tips on the ends telomeres. of our chromosomes. Telomeres. And what telomeres do is they protect our DNA in the same way that these little plastic tips keep the shoelace from unraveling. Now what happens when cells divide, not all cells divide, but many do, blood cells divide, immune cells divide, when they divide, the telomere gets a little bit shorter. And that's why scientists look at the length of a telomere as a marker of biological or cellular aging. Got that so far? Go ahead. Okay. What was found by a revolutionary study done in 2004, which has since been replicated many times by Nobel Prize winner Elizabeth Blackburn and UCSF health psychologist Alyssa Eppel, was that stress actually can erode those telomeres, aging our cells before our time, essentially. Uh, they looked at caregiving moms. They were caring for children with chronic diseases. And they had them take this test called the perceived stress test. Mm. And what they found was, was that those who perceived themselves as being under the most stress had telomeres that were shorter by the equivalent of 10 years. Taking 10 years off our lives? Than those who perceived themselves as being under the least stress. So what do we do? Okay, did you catch that most important word there? Perceived. Perceived. Oh, I get it, I'm a good listener. Perceived, you're an excellent listener. So. Circumstances in and of themselves are not what freak us out. It's how we react to those circumstances. Attitude? Well, perception. Okay, I'm in a supermarket. Okay. Woman in front of me, guy in front of me, I think they're taking too long. Okay. Or I'm on the Garden State Parkway. Oh, yeah. Steam right? coming out of your ears, right? All right. And all yeah. of a sudden, guy cuts me <laughs> off, usually a guy, and I want to give him a particular finger. Okay. And either I, I give him... I won't ask which one. No. I'm either going to give him a <laughs> finger... I'm going to scream and yell at him, or I'm going to say, you know what? I'm not in a rush. I'm going to get there safe. I got four beautiful kids. 
let me put on my, the Sinatra station on Sirius right. XM mm -hmm. and relax. That's my choice. That's exactly your choice. And the way that you respond will affect what's going on inside of your body physiologically. Yeah. So, for instance, you get all freaked out, start tearing your hair out. Yeah, now I'm going to catch stress up with him up. and I'm going to yell at him. Your stress what's levels going go on inside my body. What's going on inside is your cortisol, your primary stress hormone, is just racing through your body. It's there for a reason, because right. if you were really in a threatening situation, you need it so you can be alert yes. and so that you, know, you can run away or kill the prey or whatever yes. it is that you need to do. But the fact is, you're just sitting in a traffic jam, but your body doesn't know that. So you are accelerating the aging of your cells and your systems by having that reaction. But for instance, if you were to whistle a happy tune <laughs> or right. do some deep breathing, what I do is I exhale, diaphragmatic breathing, starting counting at 10, going down to one, you calm, things calm down, your cortisol doesn't spike, your epinephrine, which is the first stress hormone that kicks in, that doesn't spike. And so you're not eroding your telomeres, you're not aging your cells to the extent that you would in that first scenario. Why do you write this just for women? I don't write it just for women. The science, the biology, the physiology applies to men and to women. Why are you talking about sleeping? Why am I talking about sleeping? Why do you say sleep deprivation? Sleep is an incredible, sleep deprivation is an incredible stressor. It screws up your memory, it makes you gain weight, and it makes you preferentially pack that weight in your belly, which is very shocking uh, to many people. And the reason that sleep deprivation, sleep deprivation is used as a torture technique because it is so very stressful. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I ha one thing I have in the book was I've spoken with speech, ex uh, speech experts, sleep experts, and they have laid out a program of ways that you can actually help yourself to relax and get a good night's sleep. It's very important. One of the primary takeaways is mm -hmm. that you have to think of sleep as important as any other activity that you consider vital in your life. For instance, you wouldn't step out of the shower before you rinse the soap off. That's right. You're not going to get up out of bed before you've had the number of hours of sleep that your body needs. Many of the women who run the operation here at the Caucus Educational Corporation, our fine production company, uh, are clamoring in my earpiece, which creates a great oh. deal of stress, to find out this question. What can they do? Um, in spite of how young they appear to be, <laughs> what can they do to reduce or to slow down the aging process? That is uh, an obsession of theirs. Yes, it's an obsession of all of ours, men as well. Not correct? mine, but go ahead. Not yours, okay. What you want to do are, there are the five steps, yes. or the five chapters look at exercise, they look at diet, meditation, they look at changing your mind, sleep, uh, and by Following some of the steps that I lay out, you can reduce your stress, and this has been shown by scientific studies. That's one thing about my book, is all of the recommendations are backed up by scientific studies. For instance, there have been studies showing that those who exercise more, who exercise a moderate amount, what the uh, 2008 CDC guidelines recommend, that their telomeres are longer than those who are sedentary. There are studies that show mm. that uh, those with higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids in their blood mm. have not just have longer telomeres than those who don't have those higher levels, but that their telomeres lengthened over five years. A very new study just came out looking at yoga meditation, yogic meditation. It was only eight weeks. These were caregivers of uh, people with dementia, and they found that just this meditation, actually, they had longer telomeres and higher levels of an enzyme that, enzyme that lengthens telomeres than those who didn't do the meditation. Do you know, uh, Thea, I have to tell you, just by you being here, I feel a lot less stress. Do you? Yep. I don't know why. You have that calming <laughs> influence. And I'm going to steal that um, shoelace. The shoelace? Thea Singer is the author of the book, uh, Stress Less for Women, Calm Your Body, Slow Aging and rejuvenate the mind in five simple steps. Good stuff. I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for You're having very me. Very helpful. Thank very you. Very peaceful. We'll go meditate when we're done. Yes, we will. Yes. Uh, Steve <laughs> Adubato, you can feel it. You can see it. I'm, uh, He's I, seem young, I seem younger. I'm very chilled, too. <laughs> yeah, Be your right hair's back changing. Right after this. I'm radiant. <laughs>
If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org and visit us online at oneonone.org. There they are, Raphael and Nehausen and Tom Powers, directors of the Montclair Film Festival. Good to see both of you. Good, Good to, to be, be here. here. Now, this is a big deal. Yeah. The Montclair Film Festival, which will be May 1st through May 6th. Our good friend uh, Bob Feinberg, our partner, brought us together. This is a huge event, a couple of years in the making. Correct. Plug it. What makes it so special? What do you got? Well, uh, as you said, the festival is going to take place May 1st through 6th. There's a lot of energy in Montclair to see a film festival. Uh, and Raphael and I have a background running film festivals in Manhattan. I work for the Toronto Film Festival. And so the board that had put together the Montclair Film Festival reached out to us and said, you know, can you bring some of the, the contacts and, uh, and experience you have for this? So that's what we're doing. Yes, I actually serve on an honorary board with a group of other great folks in Montclair. <coughs> and uh, we should set, let folks know that uh, Evie Colbert, together with, the, the, I forget her husband's name, what's it? Stephen Colbert. I've heard of him. Yes, we actually yeah. had a great fundraiser. A lot of money was raised by Stephen, a terrific event he did with uh, John Alter from NBC, um, just one of the many events raising money for this big uh, event. Comedy is a theme. There'll be some film having to do with comedy, no? There's going to be lots of films. There's going to be comedy. There's going to be family films, classics, documentary. A section we're very excited about is Spotlight on New Jersey. Spotlight yes. on New Jersey? Yes, we're highlighting some of New Jersey's finest new filmmakers and also films that have strong New Jersey ties and connections. Is it not a fact so. that New Jersey has a disproportionate number of fabulous filmmakers? There's, you know, we did an, an open call for submissions uh, mm. as well as going around to <coughs> festivals like the Sundance Film Festival, the Toronto Film Festival, and handpicking some titles. And we were really blown away by the, the amount of material coming from New Jersey or f filmmakers who grew up in New Jersey. It's quite amazing. And you know what's interesting about this? By the way, we should let folks know that as you're looking at the, uh, the site, it, we're not in a position to announce all the films because as we're doing this program in mid-March, it's one of those things where a lot of the, a lot of the schedule is set in place, mm -hmm. but since it's not all set in place, we don't want to screw up and not, that, that's right, right? Mm -hmm. And so go on the film festival site every time you're watching the show because as new films get signed, they will be put up on there, right? Correct. All the latest information about films, events, parties, everything is going to be on the website. And also people can follow us on Facebook and on Twitter as well. You know, let me ask you, you know, I think about the Tribeca Film Festival, which a lot of people know with Robert De Niro and others. Um, film is alive, more alive than ever before. For people who sit there and go, ah, I want to go sit in my house and look at the DVD on demand. It's not the same. Well, what we think is great about a film festival is that half the experience is watching the films, but the other half of the experience is talking about them after, interacting with your community. You know, we think film is uh, an experience that should be shared with an audience, not at home alone. Let's describe what's going to be like for folks, because there have been some events that you've had leading up to the film festival. I should let folks know that there have been a whole range of educational events, and uh, we've had an event up at the uh, Iris, I call it the Iris Gardens, mm -hmm. which is a wonderful place in Montclair. By the way, Montclair is one of these towns where we have a it's an incredible number of really talented people, and so many have been on one-on-one. -on -one. I feel like so many of the folks in Montclair are artistic and talented. Mm -hmm. There's nothing against the other great towns in the mm -hmm. tri-state region. But at the Iris Gardens, there was an open... We had, last summer, there was a film... What was it? The, the um, Why am I drawing a blank on it? Was it The Sound of Music? Was, no, they had The Sound of, the music, sound of music, music as part of Monclarissimo. It's a free summer series, which will be back again this year after the festival. We will be having more films as part of that. Outside film. You know what yeah. that reminded me of? A great film I saw a while back. Uh, Cinema Paradiso. Yes. Remember, right? One of my top five. Right. Well, yeah. One, yeah. Without even saying it, I knew that. I didn't want to get into that film because <laughs> it made me cry. Uh, Cinema me Paradiso, too. where they showed yeah. the film against the wall in this yeah. little southern Italian village. Never mind, I'm not going to yeah. go into that. But it brings people together, it brings a community together. But not everyone's going to be from Montclair, right? No, no. I mean, one of the things we're hoping for is really to get other people to come and experience Montclair. So many of our filmmakers, which we can't announce yet, but they're from places outside of Montclair, and they will be participating in the festival. And part of the format of the festival is many of the films will have a conversation with the filmmaker after the film. So it's really a chance to both see the film and take part in a conversation with the filmmaker or the talent. Describe that. Why would that be so important, Tom? 
just to have conversations. Well, you know, after lots of times when you see a film, as, especially a film like a documentary, you know, you've got so many questions that you want to ask that, uh, and we're going to give people an opportunity to keep those conversations going. The other thing that's interesting is I've seen some of your stuff on our partner, our sister station, NJTV. You were out there. We were out in Toronto doing some video after... Um, oh, was it the Sundance Film oh, Festival? Sundance. And, uh, and we did a bunch of spots uh, for NJTV where we were interviewing filmmakers. So. And the other thing that I know we're going to do, because we're, we have a partnership with NJTV, we're going to grab some of the footage from the Montclair Film Festival. I know we're going to be airing it on NJTV as well, and our partner, John Savidio, as well, mm -hmm. the general manager. Um, interesting. As I think about the film festival, how does a family, you know, children of our family, all different ages, should we be looking for family films as well as films that my wife and I can see and then children, mm -hmm. films for the kids to see? What should we be looking for as we go on the website? What should we be doing? Absolutely. Well, when you go to MontclairFilmFest.org, you're going to see films for all tastes. You're going to see uh, family films. There's some weekend matinee films that are, you know, really uh, meant to, you know, uh, bring out young people to and, and enjoy. And then there are films, you know, at night that maybe leave the kids with a babysitter right. and uh, and come out and try something new. Where will the films be shown? Not just outside, but also some of the theaters. There's uh, several different locations. The Claird Cinema in Montclair, the Bellevue Cinema in Montclair. There's a couple events at Montclair State University. Okay, and the other thing I'm real curious about, it's going to impact the community itself. Mm -hmm. A film festival impacts a community. The restaurants and, and the other social aspects of the town. How so? Well, I think one of the things that's very exciting for us about this festival is it's really a festival by the community for the community. So, I mean, the second you have a film festival, there's a different energy being created as people come visit the town, get to know the restaurants, the shops. It really does have a very strong rejuvenating effect on a town. I mean, I'll give you an example. Raphael and I have been going for many years to the Traverse City Film Festival in Michigan. Traverse City? Traverse City, Michigan. This is a film festival that Michael Moore helped uh, okay. begin. Uh, it's been running for about seven years now. And that film festival has transformed that town economically, artistically. Um, it's a real inspiration for us. And Sundance is, in many ways, on the map because of. Uh, well, uh, hugely. I mean, uh, Park City, Utah, uh, <coughs> which was a, you know, a sleepy uh, ski town, um, really gets transformed um, uh, every year. The Telluride uh, Film Festival in Colorado is, you know, is another good example of, of you know, s small places that are really identified with film festivals. Go ahead. And one of our goals is, yes, it's a film festival by the community for the community, but we really hope Montclair becomes a destination film festival in the coming years. So people from outside of Montclair will come, spend a week, watch a bunch of movies, get to know the town. And we should also let uh, folks know that Montclair is very accessible you know, to New York, excuse me, from New York. Mm -hmm and also every other location you can imagine. Mass transit is easy to get to. Uh, Montclair is easy to get to via mass transit. Raphael and Tom, I want to thank you for joining us. The directors of the Montclair Film Festival, the website has been up the entire time. It is going to be May 1st through May 6th. And by the way, hopefully if you're seeing this show before that, uh, you want to make sure you go. If you see it afterwards, that means you just check it out the next time. But I want to thank both of you for joining us. It's going to be a great event. And those of us who are part of the board, we look forward to a great event, and we know we brought in the right people. Yeah. Folks, one on one, or in this case, you know, one on two, we'll continue right after this. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Thank you both very much. If you would like more information on this program, or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org and visit us online at oneonone.org. Stefan Camfer is the author of a wonderful book, a provocative book called Tough. Without a Gun, The Life and the Extraordinary Afterlife of Humphrey Bogart. Stefan, I want to thank you for joining us on One on One. My pleasure. You know, it's been uh, over 50 years that uh, Bogart's been gone. He died in 1957, and oddly enough, he's bigger than ever. He was 57 when he died. Yes, very sad. He died of esophageal cancer because he was a smoker and a drinker, and uh, it got to him. Question. Um, he didn't even get into acting until he was late 30s or so? Well, he was in his 20s, but he didn't get into serious acting until he was 30s. Right, he was poking around for a long time. It was an accident. He had no idea what to do with his life. He came from wealth. Right, his unlike Cagney was, and others Oh, no, at that they were time. street kids. He was, I mean, you know, uh, Edward G. Robinson had to wince when he shot his uh, uh, pistol off. He, he, none of these guys were tough. 
And, uh, and Cagney used to say that Bogart was as tough as Shirley Temple. But, <laughs> but on screen, he was tough. He just had that. He projected a masculinity and a coolness that I think has uh, stayed with us. Why? I mean, I mean, let's talk about some of the movies, by the way. And most folks know, but just let's make sure we go through them. The Maltese Falcon, uh, Casablanca, The Big Sleep, The African Queen, and The Cane Mutiny. Um, those are just some, the big mm -hmm. ones. Why, and I know there's so many reasons, Stefan, does he endure after so many years? Well, there are a lot of reasons. One of them is that uh, he, has, he never yielded to any of the feminist pressures or the feelings that man has to be sensitive. He was a sensitive guy, actually, and he was a, something of an aristocrat. He was the kind of man who walked on the outside when he went down the street with a lady. He was always nice to his wives, even though there were four of them. Right. But he, uh, I think, projected on screen a kind of gritty, uh, unyielding masculinity and honesty. I think you always felt that he would make a sacrifice for integrity. That is, that's what he does, by the way, in the Maltese Falcon when he has to hand over the woman he loves to the cops because she's killed his partner. I hope I haven't spoiled anything for anybody. <laughs> and in Casablanca, you know, he gives up the most beautiful girl in the world, Ingrid Bergman, because she's got to stay married to the man who leads the underground and he's going to go off and fight the war himself. And we believed it. Talk about Sierra Madre. Well, Sierra Madre is my favorite of the Bogart movies. It, there's no romance in it. The women have very small parts in it. And he plays a paranoid who, in the end, is, uh, gets his head lopped off. But he has an enor enormous range in there because he starts out as a kind of guy who is just a, a miner, doesn't quite know where the gold is. And he winds up greedy, terrible, and eaten by gold fever. It's quite a performance, and it's one that's quite different from what Bogart usually did, which was to either get the girl or lose the girl mm. nobly. It's not a noble performance. It's just a great one. You know, the, the Lauren Bacall thing I want to talk about in a second, but Bogart, the other thing that struck me, um, his testimony before the United States Congress, his, his public speaking out um, at a critical time in American history dealing with Joe McCarthy yes. and the uh, pursuit of so-called communists in Hollywood. Talk about that. Well, he had two roles in that. One was not so great. I mean, he originally, he and John Huston and Evelyn Keyes and Jannie Kay and many others so objected to the fact that the House of American Activities Committee was going to Hollywood strictly for headlines and saying, we want subversives out of here. And subversives could be anyone from a real communist to somebody who wanted to integrate the major leagues. You know, they were all involved in this. Terrible things happened because of it. Some people got blacklisted out of the business, like Zero Mostel didn't work right. for 20 years. But uh, Bogart eventually saw, and he was a leader, that he was being used by a lot of the communists in Hollywood 10 who lied to their own lawyer about being communists and who took over the House on Activities Committee meeting and, and uh, I think made fools of themselves and he objected to it. He didn't want anybody to push him around on the left or on the right. He was a truly independent soul, so he dropped that. And people said that he had lost a lot of his career because of it. That is the drive of his career. Mm. I don't think it's true at all. He just, he just decided he would go on his own. Yeah, he, did, he always did things on his own. So Lauren Bacall is uh, 20. He's 45. 19. Nin yeah. <sighs> was it scandalous? No, I think what happened was, you know, she was, by her own testimony, virginal, innocent. He did everything he could to keep a marriage that was his third marriage going. He was married to an alcoholic, very violent woman, and even then he said, go to rehab, we'll make this work, we'll make this work. And only when it was clear that it wasn't going to work did he allow himself to get involved with this teenager. And at that he felt very embarrassed by it at first, but he couldn't stop himself. She was gorgeous, she was different, and the marriage worked. I mean, they stayed married till he died, and they had two kids, so I think it could be said that he made the right choice. He got married after that? No. Um, you said she four. got married. Yeah, because you said four. Hold on. He had how many he, marriages? He had four marriages. This, she was his fourth. She was his fourth. Last, okay, yes. You threw me off there because no. there was no there, one after that, after, right? Oh, no, there weren't, but there, all four were actresses, which says something about him. He never went outside the stage. How, let me ask you something. Bogart, a generous, I know this word is used a lot, a generous actor in terms of trying to be helpful to others? Always. Um, there are two ways you can be generous as an actor. One is Privately, you see somebody down on his luck. You either help get him in your picture or on stage. He did that with Fatty Arbuckle. He did it with Peter Lorre, who was a, a, a druggie. Always helped him along. The other way is to be generous as an actor. Listen to the other actors. Don't steal the scene. And he never did. 
he, uh, he was always good to the people he worked with, and they loved him because of it. You were in a Bogart picture, you were also in a picture. Speaking of uh, other greats, uh, Catherine Hepburn, African Queen. Well, that was a wonderful, that was made in heaven. Nobody, they weren't very close friends, and of course she had eyes only for Spencer, you know, you know <laughs> no, no idea of, of romance with Bogart. Bogart's idea of an out-of-town trip was to take his yacht or boat three miles off of Catalina. He didn't like to travel at all. All of a sudden he's in Africa, in Uganda, because John Huston wanted them the to director. really sweat. The, right. John Huston, the director, wanted him to really sweat. He wanted him to really be sick sometimes. He wanted him to be out She in the got sun. sick. She got very sick because she was a urologist's daughter, and urologists say, hydrate all the time, drink, drink. So she bought bottled water, which of course was not bottled at all. It was off of the faucet, and some guy had phonied it up, and she got violently ill. Although she made, every day she made the casting call. At six o'clock, eight o'clock, whatever it was, she made it. Sometimes she'd throw up between scenes, but she always was there. Bogart uh, lived on canned beans and whiskey. He in Houston lived on whiskey. Let that be a lesson to you out there. That, so <laughs> if you go to Africa, drink whiskey. And, and uh, you know, he always felt that it was the, it was when he switched to gin, that's what did him in. He was perfectly good with brown liquor. I got to tell you something. 57 years after, he lives to only 57, right? Yes. I got to tell you, uh, tough without a gun. The life and the extraordinary afterlife of Humphrey Bogart by Stephen Kempfer. Um, it is a must read. It is a terrific book. The New York Times gave it a great review. Other people think it's great. It is one of the most enjoyable books I've read. And I want to thank you, Stephen, for joining You're us very kind. and gracing thank us you. in one on one. Thank you very My pleasure. much. It was terrific. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Barnabas Health, Qualcare Inc., the law firm of Gibbons PC. Verizon Communications, and by TD Bank. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. I'm John Campbell, Berkeley College, Class of 98, Associate's Degree in Paralegal Studies. I'm Busi Matsiko Andan, Berkeley College Class of 2004, Bachelor's Degree in Business Administration. Melvin Montalvo, Class of 91 and 2003, Degrees in Accounting and Management. Simi Papachin, Class of 2001, Bachelor's Degree in Business Administration. From different walks of life, our students succeed in different ways, yet their first step is exactly the same. Berkeley College. I'm Steve Adubato. Join me for the next edition of Caucus New Jersey Taxes, Healthcare, Education, and the Economy. I'll ask the questions that you want answered. Airing on NJTV 13 and WHYY. Check your local listings.